Okay. All right. Uh, welcome to the March 17th TSC call. Happy St. Patrick's Day for those of you who celebrate. Um, as you are all aware, uh, you've been to this call before and probably many other Hyperledger calls, but there's two things that we must abide by. The first one is the antitrust policy notice that is currently displayed on the screen. And the second is the code of conduct, uh, which is linked in our agenda. Uh, don't be a jerk. So with that, uh, we'll hop to the announcements. Uh, so the first one is one that we talk about every week. The Dev Weekly Developer Newsletter goes out tomorrow. Um, if there's something that you want to add to that, please leave a comment on the wiki page that is linked in the agenda, and that will go out to hundreds of Hyperledger developers. Uh, the second announcement is the uh, uh, CFP is now open for the Hyperledger Global Forum, uh, and that CFP closes on April 29th. So if you have any talks that you would like to give at the Global Forum, please submit those at the link that is provided here on the, the agenda. Are there any other announcements that anybody has? Okay, seeing no hands, I will take that as no. Um, so the first thing that we have are our quarterly reports. Uh, we did get the Hyperledger Firefly uh, report in on Tuesday. And I have seen that there are uh, some of us that have had the opportunity to review that, but not everybody has had a chance to review that yet. Um, there is some conversation that is ongoing in the, um, in the report. I will apologize for not being up to date on those. Uh, it's been an early morning for me uh, with the time change. So uh, I guess the, um, the first thing that we have is related to um, getting more people interested in becoming maintainers. Uh, and there's a, a discussion ongoing there around that. Um, is there anything that anybody has as far as suggestions uh, for the Firefly folks, as far as other ways that they've had good luck in getting people interested in being long-term maintainers on the projects. No additional suggestions other than what is here. Nathan? Being a maintainer is a lot of work. So I'm less worried about whether or not um, all the maintainers are from one organization and more worried about when all the maintainers, maintainers are from one organization. It's easy to miss communications details uh, and make it hard for anyone else to kind of get in the door or it can create a situation where pull requests have a lot of friction to external contributors. So um, I, I think part of the one of the questions that that's kind of underlying this thread is not just how can we make it more friendly for an external maintainer or how can we help you get an external maintainer but how, is there any way we can help measure kind of if some of this invisible friction might be happening yeah i think that's a, a really good point Nathan. uh kamlesh uh yeah hi jesse so uh, actually, I also commented in the report section. Uh, actually, uh, uh, when this 1.0 release came, so on that time also we should come with some details about the us usability in the production deployment of the uh, Firefly because uh, in the user adoption perspective, it depend like uh, how how much production deployment of the particular uh, uh, framework is and uh, and how people are adopting it and then. Like currently, like there's a only Clydeo is the maintainers of the project. So, uh, kind of getting the maintainers and contributor other across uh, different uh, organization or individuals is important to be uh, to be uh, project as a as a wide adoption. I I know that like Firefly is a very good uh, concept and kind of multi-party system because blockchain is complete, not just the only blockchain layer. There are multiple components and systems are there and is 
is good uh, but i think when we come to this stable or lts kind of release in the future we should also some come up with this details about the production deployment in the uh, customers that 5.51 yeah, Kamalash, I think, you know, if we look at uh, the funnel, right, it starts with people using the projects uh, to determining that they need to contribute uh, because there's either a feature missing that they want uh, added to it or there's a bug that they need fixed. And so they uh, jump in to contribute. Um, and then those contributors are uh, what end up being maintainers in the long run, right? Um, so it's obviously is a funnel and, and starting with the users is a, is a place that we can think about how we get more people interested in the project as a whole. Arun. Thanks, Tracy. Hey, um, I see Firefly as a beneficial project in multiple fronts and, and there is an idea that probably Firefly team can apply or probably try out. Um, this has been work, I mean, this has worked for Aries group at least as I, as I see. Uh, the approach would be that we so the the way the reason Aries group has been so successful is so that each repository or each uh, framework that they build in different languages is kind of independent and independently maintained by different organizations and what features they keep adding could would follow a spec but it goes in its own phase right so firefly being a, a project that has similar features not I'm not saying through, I mean, technically the same features. I'm talking in terms of how wide a spectrum it covers. So there are components that deal with different blockchains uh, protocols, and then there are components that are more generic in nature and how they deal with providing some of the capabilities. So if Firefly team can focus on those aspects, maybe there would be people who are interested in those individual components, and they would jump in in maintaining those individual parts at least. So that way, um, there is more uh, contribution coming in, and then probably eventually they will realize hey, there are some aspects that they they can get involved in the core uh, as well, and that way they can grow further. So yeah, that's my thought. All right, thanks, Arun. So Nico, I, I see you've joined us and I appreciate you joining us today. Um, questions or, or comments on, on kind of what you've heard? Yeah, thank you. Um, I appreciate all the, the, the questions and the, the thoughts and the feedback, it's, it's helpful. Um, and I, yeah, I, I agree that it's a funnel and uh, you know, David Boswell and I have had many conversations about how that, that, that it is indeed a funnel and uh, trying to grow that funnel at the start and getting more people to use Firefly. Uh, we have, we're, we're working on a, a workshop uh, coming up next month to, to try to get more people just familiar with how to use it. Um, so, and, and Arun, I like your suggestion as well of like having, having maintainers of some of the, like, Firefly has a lot of different repos. It's a, it's a microservice architecture. Uh, and it was actually designed that way in so that the barrier to entry for being able to contribute additional pieces to it would be lower <clears throat> so that you know, folks don't have to understand all of the detail of how the core itself works in order to, to make a contribution to one of the um, you know, connectors or, or, or other pieces. So um, yeah, that, that's a great thought as well. Um, but yeah, I appreciate the thoughts and, and, the, and the feedback. I know this was a topic on, on the last report, so I wanted to at least comment on it. Um, I know it takes time and uh, I just, uh, yeah, the, the, I think the, the reasoning for the, the extra comments that I added on this report was just to, um, to emphasize the fact that like it's something that the Firefly community is acutely aware of and something that we want to keep working on, but uh, also recognizing that it does take time. Yeah, definitely. Bobby? Um, I just have to speak to the project we did with Firefly um, with the giving chain. And I think the reason why none of the um, people moved from using the project to maintainers is they were through the mentorship program and they were all students. So students are looking for permanent jobs, not you know being able to maintain. You know, so that I think was possibly a disconnect that maybe in the future we could try to figure out how to solve that. 
Yeah, we've seen um, not just through the, the mentorship program too, but through a, a lot of other connections that we've made. Students discover the project and, and say, well, hey, this is really cool. I want to make this as my first open source contribution. And they make a contribution, which is great, but then they move on. And you know, they've, they've been able to now put on their resume that I've made contributions to open source projects and uh, it's, it's great for them. But uh, like you said, it doesn't bring that kind of long-term consistent contribution that we're hoping for someday. Angela? Yeah, thank you, Tracy. Uh, I must admit, I always, uh, I, would, I want to say something generic, not related to uh, Firefly. Um, I always thought about this tension between the fact that most of the, the projects in Hyperledger, they are backed by companies with a clear strategy. So maintainers is more than just, uh, uh, just putting in a, a few, some contribution. It's also someone who has a, an impact on the, the strategy, the directions of the, the project. So it's something deeper. Um, and I'm wondering what it means, how can someone externally to the main company that is behind the project uh, jump in? This true, can be true also for Fabrica. So please don't, uh, it's not something that, uh, it's only for Firefly, but for many projects in Hyperledger where there is a strong company behind. I see that there is a tension. I don't know. I must admit, I don't know how to resolve this uh, uh, this tension. Yeah, I think I think there's definitely uh, a tension there that we see across all of our projects. Um, so not just Firefly, uh, as you mentioned, Angelo. And um, you know, I think if we if we kind of go back to that that funnel idea, um, it is very possible that. Uh, as we get more organizations that are using the project, they become more interested in helping to, to guide the strategic direction of the project and, and then obviously becoming maintainers as well. Um, it's, you know, it, it's probably not the, the answer, the complete answer, but it is uh, probably part of the answer. Kamlesh? So uh, to see what Angelo saying, I think, I think everyone will be agree because I, when like uh, what are the projects we have there are not a kind of uh, mixed majority of the different contributors whether it be like a fabric or like a firefly or what even like even eris indy and i think uh like suppose you take example of kubernetes uh like uh, uh open source project in linux foundation uh kubernetes is diversity in the kind of contribution whether it's a google product or google open source uh, contribution but I think maybe it will take time that much uh, reach that level, like one project project having an, uh, more than 50% diversity in the contributions, uh, maybe down the line four to five years, I believe. But I think that is very important to be successful of any open source project to be, uh, I think not just the hyperledger, but it was when we take a, can talk about the like uh, Ethereum related projects like consensus forum or other things. This is also company driven uh, project. Thanks, thanks, Kamlesh. Um, all right, uh, with that, yeah, Jim. Hey, thanks, Tracy. Um, just want to add uh, one more aspect. Um, I think in general, um, we, we observe that people get confused of what uh, Firefly does, uh, how it fits into the picture. We often often get questions of, can you tell us how Firefly compares to Fabric to, to Pesu? You know, questions like that. Um, I, you know, for, for other projects, Bevel, that's for infrastructure, Cactus, Interop, very clear, uh, very clear labels that, you know, get people to understand what those projects do. We, we, we need uh, um, like a easy to understand label like that. I think we were using, we were experimenting with multi-party systems. Don't know if that's been effective, honestly. We probably need to think about another marketing term to give Farfly so people understand what it is. Um, I, I'm sure uh, the, the marketing team may have ideas, uh, but we should talk about that. Um, in the future. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with you, with you, Jim. I think, uh, how do we, how do we get people to understand why you would use Firefly when you would use Firefly? 
um, those are the the important pieces to to help other people kind of really see the the benefit. Angela. Yeah, I think what, what uh, I found very interesting this uh, this comment, and I, I want to report something that I found also uh, a bit strange from my point of view. I saw a blog post with cactus weaver and uh, uh, firefly, and there was a table in this blog kind of comparing the three things. And there was a table where firefly was was sticking more green lights, and to myself I was asking, but firefly is not an interoperability tool, so why is there? And first. Why sticking more? So it, look, it looks like that Firefly is better than Cactus and, uh, um, and Weaver, but they, 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 they seem to be a bit different beasts. Probably I, I misunderstood the, the, the blog post, but that blog post it, it, uh, it at least misled me. Yeah, Jim. Yeah, I think that's part of the problem with Firefly because it, it sits on top of the ledgers. So architecturally, it does fit in where the interop uh, components do, and it does address a lot of the requirements in the in the same uh, same concerns with interop. Um, and because it does so many does so many things, it, it, it hard it's hard to give it a concise label like interop or or infrastructure. Um, I think that's part of the the, the struggle uh, we're we're in. All right, so um, definitely some some good commentary I think here on Firefly. I'd like to to move us on in the discussion topics uh, so that we can reach all of our topics today. Um, just FYI for the TSC, the URSA report did come in. I saw it show up in my inbox um, for us to have a, a review. So um, please remember that that's out there waiting for you to take a look at. Um, and then as far as the, the discussion topics go, um, the first thing that I wanted to do, I know the, the mentorship project selection task force was created last week. Um, and I know we have a short turnaround as far as the um, as far as when we have to have the, the mentorship project selected. So I wanted to get, see if we could get a quick update from uh, the folks who are in that selection task force to see how it's going, um, if there's any help that is required. I think that was Angelo, Peter, uh, I can't remember the other two people who volunteered. Yes, any? I did. Okay, go ahead, Angelo. Oh no, sorry, sorry. I, I, I thought I was on mute. No, no, I want, I want to, I was saying that, yeah, I want to, sorry. Uh, yeah, so any update, uh, Angelo, Dano, Kamlesh, Peter? Uh, so I think Kamlesh, yes. So I think uh, Meen asked, uh, said some kind of uh, uh, reference last time, reference point, how we will reference last time. And she just asked the confirmation or whether this process is correct or not. And then we all, I think, put three replied to that main, and we agreed like this. We can follow that process, and then now main, main will create the uh, that particular evolution sheet for the mentorship projects. Okay, so you guys do have a, a way forward, a path forward. Yeah. Uh, and, great, Angela. Yeah, just to say that I, I saw many, many amazing uh, proposals. So I, I really appreciate uh, all the, and I, I want to really thank all the uh, the contributors uh, of, uh, of, the, of the proposals. Some are very great. Very good. Good to hear. All right. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad that you guys have a direction forward. I want just to check in there quickly and make sure that uh, there was nothing that we could do uh, to help out with that, but I will, um, let you guys continue with that process and hopefully come back to us here shortly with uh, your recommendations so that we can take those forward. All right, this, the next topic on the agenda is the Hyperledger documentation style guide. So this is a, a topic that Dano brought up in the chat. Um, I think it was Tuesday um, where there's a, a question that exists in the, the BASU contributors meeting where they they wanted to understand kind of what the what the hyperledger recommendations are as far as um, as far as 
guidelines around how we do documentation at Hyperledger? Is there anything that we have in place for style guides? Uh, currently, they're linking to a bunch of different style guides across, say, Microsoft and Consensus, and probably some others within the, the base documentation for how they do documentation. Uh, so Dan, I wanted to kind of have this conversation. And then I think the second piece of this is also um, the discussion that we started last week with the grid.hyperledger.org um, and whether or not we want consistency in that. So Dano, uh, I probably massacred your, your request, but if there's something else uh, that, that we should add to the description of what this is, please. No, I think you, you've got most of the, the core of it. Um, there's about at least three threads coming up related to documentation. And it seems like there's a lot more of these questions coming up for documentation, such as style and, um, you know, for example, including the DEI statements in there, how and where should we do that? Um, do we link to external styles? Should we have a consistent style across all the projects or let each individual project do their own thing? And the reason I wanted to discuss this in this group was because Bobby's raising her hand and I wanted to see what her opinion was on this. Um, I just know that um, from a documentation perspective, we had received at the Learning Materials Working Group um, some documents from the Marketing Committee. Um, so on the homepage right up front, there's a Hyperledger Style Master template, which has uh, PowerPoint slides as to what Hyperledger uses for their style. It's not a build your documentation style guide. Um, I know we have uh, the beginnings of that somewhere else, like what format we should use to create documentation um, in that way, but that'll get you a head start as to what Hyperledger has put out publicly as the style master template. And it's just a link to a Google Drive. I'll put it in the chat. Yeah, I was about to ask where that link is on the front page, but the chat link would be great. Yeah, I think, I think those templates are mostly for presentations that we would do within Hyperledger. Um, so I think, Dano, you're talking more about the read the doc sites or, or whatever the documentation site is. It is the user guides and the developer guides and the contributor guides and, and those sorts of things. Is that right, Dano? Right. That was more long. You know, presentations and, and outward focus things are, are one thing, but when people come in looking how to use the projects, what the standard should be, should we go to use the doc? Should we load it all in the wiki? Should we load some stuff in the wiki? Should we use um, a wiki docs inside of GitHub? Those are some of the, do we want to standardize those things? Or do we want each project the freedom to do their own thing? It is more the scope of the question I was, I was looking for rather than use questioning whether we use active or passive descriptions when talking about configuration options. You know, those I think we don't need to go into that level of, of description, but I think some of the higher level infrastructure experience, how do you come in and experience the document might be some of the more valuable things. And projects might be happy having different entry points. That's an option too. All right, Arun, I'm gonna skip you for a moment because I wanna see if Bobby has uh, feedback on the, the conversation that we're currently having before we move on. Bobby? No worries, we also have on the Learning Materials Working Group a best practice page, um, which, um, basically gives the start of what we're talking about um, for all the different standards for use cases, white papers, uh, webinars, courses, and chapters, that whole thing. Um, it is not complete because our numbers have diminished at the Learning Materials Working Group, but it would be something that I would be interested in pursuing um, to get that down and get that something the community can use. All right, thanks, Bobby. Uh -huh. Yeah, um, thanks, Tracy. So I guess my, I, I just wanted to understand more the reason why this kind of question is coming up. So let's say we have multiple projects. It's it's difficult for us to standardize across all different kinds of project, how the documentation should be structured around, or probably what we can help through or what we can think through is, hey, does this documentation cover a way for somebody to go back to, let's say, search for other options at Hyperledger or probably understand what Hyperledger is and how far can we get involved and what does the mission and vision statement for the each for each of the project when we can define these kind of things as opposed to defining the structure around the project documentation itself. So it's kind of abstract for me still to think through anything for this proposal. 
Yeah. So uh, Arun, um, I think if I had to if I had to take a, a stab at this, right, um, kind of off the top of my head, um, I would think about the different sorts of recommendations we would want to make, um, guidelines, if you will, for the sorts of things that we should make sure we're including in our documentation, the same way as we have guidelines for um, what we should include in the uh, repo structure, right? So we, we say we should include a readme and the maintainers and the contributing and, and those sorts of things. I think we could do a very similar sort of things with recommendations for what I think we would want to include in each of the different documents, um, be them, you know, uh, the inclusive language guidelines that we provided, uh, you know, thinking about the different audiences that might exist as we would want them to be able to, to come in and experience our projects from a documentation perspective from uh, people who are using the projects to people who want to develop within the projects to people um, you know, um, who even want to become a maintainer, right? I know in the Fabric documentation, there's stuff about the steps that it takes to become a maintainer. And um, I think even the BASU one has information about um, what it takes to become a maintainer. So I, I, this was things that I was looking at actually when we were, when I was reviewing the, the Firefly uh, report and thinking about that. Uh, so I know I ran across those in, in our different projects. Um, so I think, you know, Dan will correct me if I'm wrong, but I mean, I think that would be the start. And then I don't know if there's other things that you would expect to see as far as guidelines or recommendations for, for what we would include in documentation. Right. I think that's anything beyond that starts getting into um, how technical it's steering, when does steering become direction? Um, I think, yeah the high level stuff, just standard places to enter, standard things to expect, I think would be a good start. Um, does the learning materials working group have a regular meeting? Maybe I should call in there to get a feel for what's going on there. Yes, we meet every other Monday at 1 p.m. It's on the calendar. Okay. Uh, and I put the I like link to calendar. the, I put the link to the template guide in the Discord. Okay, thanks. Um, Bobby, the time zone, 1 p.m. Eastern daylight time. Thank you. <laughs> um, OK. Um, so other thoughts on, on whether or not this makes sense? Uh, if, if we want to continue down this road, if we want to see about building on what the learning materials working group already has in place. I'm thinking I'm going to call the learning materials group and invite anybody else interested to call in this next Monday. Um, okay. They seem to have a lot of their hands around what needs to be done already and have a good understanding of what the gaps and what the needs may be. So. Okay. Um, well, the next topic is brainstorming and creation of task forces. Do we think this requires a task force um, that we should add in our add a choice box here? Or do we think the learning materials working group? I think, the, I think okay. that's kind of the job of the learning materials. Okay, perfect. I will leave it up to you guys then to to drive that forward. And and definitely come back to the TSC, right? Uh, when you think you have something that is is worthwhile, I think we can definitely put this out on tsc.hyperledger.org as a guideline, um, similar to some of the other guidelines that we have. Okay. Good. All right. Then, um, yeah, the next, the next topic is brainstorming some creation of task forces. So in the last meeting, I think I heard loud and clear um, that we, we think that task forces are, are maybe the, the right way to go, the right way to get people involved um, and participating in things that they're interested in and then really driving forward a particular work product as, as those task forces meet and uh, do a specific task and then come back to the TSC with their recommendations and um, how they would like to, to move something forward. So hopefully I, I heard that right. I, I felt like you guys were screaming at me that that's what you wanted. So if I didn't uh, hear that right, um, 
let's let's uh, have that discussion first before we we move forward. All right, nobody's screaming at me the opposite way, so um, I'll, I'll take it that I did hear that right. The um, so I think the first step that I want to take here is really just doing some brainstorming, right? I tried to capture some of the things that I heard in the last meeting, which you can see in this checklist below uh, around documenting the TSC responsibilities, uh, some gap analysis of what we might be missing compared to the public blockchain ecosystem. Um, I don't think that came up during the call, but it did come up in a conversation that I had immediately following the call. Um, and is maybe a bit more on the technical steering side, if you will, right? Thinking about what projects we might be missing um, within the Hyperledger ecosystem that we should think about how we bring into Hyperledger. Uh, standardizing certain pieces of the technology that we have within Hyperledger. That was also another topic that came up offline um, and is more technical in focus. Um, and then uh, the other pieces here are things that we've had on the agenda before, but I think maybe just require us to go off and have very dedicated time focus to uh, project health dashboards that we can work with the LFX Insights team on, and then the project families website revamp um, that we've been talking about uh, at least in, um, well, I think for a while, but also directly in, in one of the meetings that we had this past month. So with that, I'm going to see if we have any other ideas for task forces that people might be interested in uh, starting as we as we move forward. These look like a good start to me. Okay. Uh, all right, so if that's the case, then we do actually have a poll that we can maybe do some voting on and see where we end up with uh, what people think are the, the top ones that we, we should focus on. Um, Daniela, before we go there. Yeah, um, I just wanted to just highlight a couple of things. Um, and it doesn't mean that we, we need to add these task force today to the discussion, um, but recently the, the diversity and inclusion working group um, had, you know, they've been having conversations over the last few months in regards to taking more of a task-based approach to DCI initiatives under the TSC. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, Lindsay um, Nuon, who had been serving as the chair for the DCI working group, uh, actually posted a note um, earlier this morning on, on that list. Um, but obviously it's a, you know, it was a little bit, a couple hours before the start of the, the TSC. So I would anticipate that future task forces um, will be, uh, you know, brought forward specific to DCI initiatives. So I just wanted to let everybody know that. Yeah, thanks, Daniela. Um, I did see that email come in. Um, and I do see that Lindsay's on the call. Uh, so Lindsay, welcome to the call. Um, <laughs> Is there any sort of task force that you know immediately off the bat uh, that the DCI working group uh, would like to start up uh, as they think about moving more towards this task force model? Uh, Tracy, yeah, I'm sorry about that. Um, thank you so much, Daniela, for, for bridging the gap there. Um, I know that there were two task forces that were proposed by the group as we talked about the shift to this model. One was um, led by Peter, obviously the Lint project, and that is finished now. The second one was more around partnerships and engagement. Um, and I think that is a really key element to making sure that we continue to, you know, try to rope in different groups proactively um, and not just kind of waiting for people to come into the fold in the community. Um, I heard somebody mention earlier. Also that, you know, one of the goals that some of the other, you know, uh, projects share is making sure that we try to hit those, um, you know, hit those marks to improve the diversity within projects. And I think that maybe in lieu of creating a completely, you know, different task force just to 
focus on partnerships, we think about how to work with each of the other task force to create an environment that's, um, you know, sort of a right for folks to come and contribute who might not have been in the communities that are already present. Yeah, and I, I seem to recall a discussion around also just trying to bring uh, diversity, inclusion, and civility back to the TSC, right? Um, from the perspective of let's not have this so far removed from how we think about this on a day to day basis um, and, mm -hmm. and putting it in a working group, but thinking more of it from, um, you know, how do, we, how do we make sure that this is uh, a focus area? Um, it's not yeah. something that is, is you know, often a group that nobody joins or um, doesn't, doesn't participate in. So I think this is um, definitely something that we could consider. Do we think the, the partnerships and engagements uh, for DCI is something that we want to add to the poll before we start kind of voting? Yeah, I would definitely like uh, to see that that added. Okay. Um, I think it's an important one. Yeah, um, let me do that. I think one of the things that um, maybe had been thrown out early, but it was just sort of a seedling of an idea. Um, I think Grace mentioned it actually was that in the same spirit of just sort of looking across the ecosystem to see where the benchmarks were that other people had around this area that maybe we should go and, and start there to see you know if we're even setting the the right goals if we're setting clear and attainable um, sort of benchmarks for for people to strive for so um, I think that might be a bit more of a you know conversation to continue rather than something to um, you know, put in a working group at this time, mm -hmm. but I definitely would love ideas on if the TSC has already maybe started to think about that or um, if other people maybe had any interest or um, activity there as well already. Yeah, I don't, I don't think we have any specific goals um, that we've set other than what has come out of the, the DCI working group. Um, so I do think that that is something that, um, you know, we should continue that conversation on. Perfect. Um, that's totally something I think that uh, a lot of the folks who were consistent uh, attendees would love to do. I think the core of what we had all hoped is that we would be a resource and a support system to folks so that we weren't uh, positioning ourselves to be the expert at all, but that we were working to be um, a resource to each of the different projects. So yeah, we'd definitely love to continue that conversation to figure out how we, um, how we do that in a better way going forward. Okay, Kamlesh. So addressing the, the list of uh, potential task forces we listed, this uh, TSC planning to create this task forces or, or we need to vote to select a one off uh, from the list? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. Are you saying uh, we're, I, I guess, I, no, yeah, I, I guess. I, I'm saying, I, I'm saying like, suppose we listed document responsibilities to like certain research technology, project health, gap analysis. So all these are potential workforces we're going to be create or we need to have you have to select one of the task force which you have to create from this list. That's the question. Okay, yeah. So I think the, the plan was um, that we would basically run this as a poll to see where people's interests were, um, maybe see what the, the top priority was uh, amongst the TSC. Um, and maybe, maybe there's multiple, right? Uh, it doesn't have to just be one, um, that we, we start sooner rather than later. Um, as, as we move forward, right? So that people can, can start to participate. In my mind, I'm uh, kind of wondering, and uh, this is just a, a thought and it cannot 
uh, it doesn't have to be right but if we if say let's say we ended up with three task forces that we thought were immediately important that we were going to go off and and attack um if you will uh then maybe we change the tsc call to be a monthly call and uh, the other weeks are used for running the, the task force calls, um, you know, for the other three weeks of the month, if you will. So uh, I don't know if that's going to work. Um, it really does depend on the, the TSC and what the TSC is interested in doing. Uh, but it, it was a, a thought about, you know, is there a better way to, to make sure that people are getting involved, um, having the, the time on their calendar to actually be involved, since we all have this calendar calendar slot blocked, if you will, um, and, and then move forward from there. So uh, keep that in mind, I guess, maybe as, as we think about this, but it, it really is, let's see where your interest lies more than anything. Um, and, and if we have enough interest in a particular task force, then maybe that's the task force we kick off or the set of task forces that we kick off. Okay, okay. Jim? Yeah, thanks, Tracy. Uh, I have a specific question on the second bullet uh, mm -hmm. the gap analysis. I don't know if that's the, the right time to ask now or later. Sure, yes, definitely. Yeah, um, I feel like uh, the, the, the debate between, you know, permission chain or public chain is over. Uh, I, I feel like most customer lended were both have its places. Um, can we broaden this to uh, what, what can Hyperledger do to, to encourage the, uh, the integration between public chain and, and, and permission chain? Um, there, there are many repeatable patterns, um, things like this, not, not just what can we do to make permission uh, chain better so we can compete with the public uh, more favorably, favorably, which I felt is what the current wording is meant uh, to say. Yeah, I don't think that's what I meant to say there, Jim. Um, okay. And so I appreciate you asking that question because I, I do think it uh, it's a good one, right? To try and understand what these task forces are as we um, as we decide that we're interested in them. I think what I was thinking about is this lends itself to if you've actually been with following the TSC for a while, there was a proposal, I think, that Dan Middleton had put out about, you know, what are other projects that we should be considering bringing into Hyperledger? Um, and I think I used this as a gap analysis between, you know, maybe the public blockchain ecosystem because it was something we could compare to, um, not that we are better or worse, or uh, that it's an either or sort of question, but are there things in that space that we should be thinking about that we're not currently thinking about because um, it, it just hasn't occurred to us that we should be. So I, to me, I'm thinking more about when I think about this, what are the projects that we're missing within Hyperledger? Um, so happy to reword that if it, if it helps um, as people are trying to think about the task forces that they would be interested in. Lindsay? Is just a link for everybody's reference because I think it would be helpful to um, just have it top of mind is what the you know current process is for the creation or sort of dissolution of, of working, I'm sorry, task group task forces. Um, and if we're going to put a little bit more structure around that, um, if it's a voting system or, or whatever, or if we're changing that completely um, and, and proposing something new, just curious about that as well. Um, so you broke up right at the beginning. I didn't hear you. Uh, so I, I think the question is around what are these task forces or, or did I not get that no. right? No, I'm sorry. My connection is horrible. Okay. Um, my question was around the creation, uh, the process uh, for, for task forces. Is it uh, going to be, you know, kind of informal going forward where people just propose and then you vote um, in a sort of ad hoc way? Or is there going to be, you know, more structure to the process? 
Yeah, so we actually do have, uh, Lindsay, a task force guide that we had put out. Um, this is sort of outside of that guide, if you will. Um, but I will put this in the TSC meeting thread um, on Discord. It's a link to kind of when uh, this question had come up before around how do you propose a task force? What's the approval process? How do we report on uh, completion of the deliverables? How do we request an extension on the completion date? So while these task forces here are more coming out of the meeting that we had last week of, you know, we, we think we can um, do things better if we start uh, to, to work with task forces more than trying to uh, participate in these TSC meetings as such. Um, I don't know that, you know, we've necessarily come to any sort of agreements on how these task forces will run as far as like what their timelines are, what this, what the actual work products are. Um, I think to me, I wanted to just see if these were interesting task forces that the, the TSC was interested in and looking at, or if, um, you know, we were, I was going down the wrong path more than anything. Um, so hopefully that helps. Yeah, that definitely helps uh, quite a bit. Yeah, just your market for further discussion pretty much. But thank you so much for that. Appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. No problem. Mm -hmm. Any any other questions on kind of these task forces, what they mean? Um, Jim, I did, uh, this hasn't refreshed on the screen, but I have updated the poll to reflect a uh, a change in, in that second one to more, um, let's just say what projects are we missing within Hyperledger? Um, so hopefully, yeah, thanks for whoever did the refresh. Um, you can see kind of the current set. Um, my plan is at this point to, to take uh, five minutes and have you log into Confluence to a poll that I'm going to put in the chat and have you guys um, fill it out to see which one kind of shows up as a as one that you guys are interested in participating in. So hopefully you guys are all on Discord. And let me copy my link again, because I think I'll end up copying the TSC one if I don't copy again. And uh, have a look at the link that I just put under the 317.22 TSC meeting chat, uh, the, the thread specifically. Let me know if you guys can't find it and I'll make sure you guys can see that in one way or another. So from here, you should be able to log into Confluence, click on whichever ones you're interested in, and uh, in the end, we'll see a chart come up to see which ones float to the top. Arno. <laughs> Thanks, Frank. Uh, I, I want to go back to the scheduling aspect because that yeah. was, you know, I, I really like the idea. You you went a bit maybe too far in saying, hey, maybe we only have the TSC call once a month and use the slot for the task forces. But, you know, maybe it's not, you know, we don't drastically cut down to once a month, but maybe we're using the same slot with having just maybe you could skip every maybe every other, every, you know, every three calls mm -hmm. to make room for the task forces. I think it does have an impact because I'm sure others feel the same. I'm like, oh man, yet another call to fit into my schedule. This is much harder. And in fact, I would think that it's hard to tell, I mean, for the sake of the exercise, we can put aside the scheduling aspect and just answer based on pure interest. But I suspect the answer in practice would be different based on whether it is within existing time slots that are already blocked by the TSC or if it's something that's going to be added yet to the agenda. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah I do. I do. And I, I think that's really for us to decide what works best for everyone. Yeah. Um, you know, I think I think we've been trying with our task forces to uh, do this as a separate call. Um, which I don't know if that has helped us or, or not. Um, but I, you know, definitely would like to, to have that discussion, see what we do um, and, and where it is that we spend some time here. The, the other 
comment I would make on this is, you know, my experience, I've participated in quite a few task forces over the years. Mm -hmm. And the most successful ones are those that have a fairly narrow scope where you have very achievable goals within a limited time frame. Yes. Once, once things start to be a bit more vague as to what the end goal is, then you quickly lose attention and, and it's hard to keep people motivated and calling in all the time. Yeah, completely agree. And I, I hope these are all very small in, in their, uh, what their work scope is and, and not huge. Um, as we look at them, if, if that's not the case, then let's bring them down even further if we need to. All right, I see that we have at least five people who have voted, um, maybe more at this point. So if you haven't had an opportunity yet or you don't know where to find it, uh, let me know. I'm happy to, to send out the link. You can also click on the which task force would be, would you be interested in participating directly from the agenda link? Um, so, uh, yeah. this is, sorry, uh, I think there's one, um, uh, one uh, task force idea about the, Public blockchain, where is it? I'm not, I wanted to open the it. Yeah, so it became the, what projects are we missing within Hyperledger so that we weren't oh. comparing directly to, to public blockchains. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, no problem. All right, um, maybe, maybe if you're done uh, with doing the poll, um, I'll ask you to raise your hand in Zoom so that we know that uh, we're not waiting on anybody. I'm sorry. To... Um, Jim, Bobby. This is not a good time to want to uh, say something though. Yeah, I know. <laughs> All right, are the other folks uh, need some help um, finding the link or Nathan, I know you voted. So your hand is probably up as well. So I think we can use the checkbox instead, the check mark. So. Will the check mark stay? Yeah. That's what I just tested with. All right. <laughs> that way, if somebody wants to pick up, they can raise their hand still. <laughs> All right, uh, so this is uh, it's looking good. Um, so I think we have <laughs> the what projects are we missing within Hyperledger seems to have uh, the, the most votes here, um, followed by the project families website revamp and the document, the TSC responsibility, followed by the project health dashboards. Um, so those four have got more than one vote each. Um, I didn't realize I could click on that to show who had voted. I was trying to figure out a way. <laughs> no worries. All right, so, uh, yeah, I think just in the, the last couple minutes here, um, I'd like to I'd like to see if we can kick these off. Um, so maybe I'm asking at least for a, a volunteer to chair um, the task forces that are the first four. Uh, 
do we have anybody who'd like to speak up for the what projects are we missing within Hyperledger? Bobby, is that a hand that you fill out or a hand that you want to volunteer or a hand of a question? Okay. Um, before, sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's all good. It's all good. Any any volunteers for the what projects are we missing within Hyperledger? Kamlesh? Yeah, uh, I would love to be volunteer. Yeah. All right. So um, I think, you know, maybe the, the question is back to the, the timing issue. Do we want to try and set these up as separate meetings or do we want to set them up as meetings that run in line with the TSC calls? Uh, I think TSC call meeting is the right. Since we have four, we could, uh, you know, have the first half hour one week is one, the second half hour is the other, and then the TSC meets every three weeks. You could also start you know, the beginning for more general announcements or, you know, items on the table and then do breakouts. Okay. Uh, these are all good ideas. Uh, Arun, you brought your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to speak up on this part. It's been hard to recruit people on the task force itself. Mm -hmm. And there are definitely people who would be interested who will join every time there is a task force meeting called for. But I guess reusing TSA meeting is probably going to benefit us. And I mean, that's a committed time and we could potentially ask more people to join and see, let them see what we as a TSA do. Okay, so we're at the top of the hour. Uh, let me take as an action item to uh, write out a few options, um, maybe have us uh, think about those options and, and respond back on the TSC mailing list uh, to which option you think works best um, as we move forward. So apologize for running long today, guys. Uh, I will get that email out and hopefully we can get started on these task forces as we move forward. So thank you for joining today. Yeah, thank you. See you guys. Thanks, Tracy. Yeah, Thanks. Thank Bye. you. Bye, everybody.